Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Superhero Politics. I'm your host, Michael Holmes, and we're going to talk about jacking up some timelines. All right. Thank you guys for being with us and coming back. At the end of this episode, we got some really big news, some really great news that uh, is going on, both in the comic book world and the political world. Uh, I've got some announcements to make, but we're going to get into this episode. Um, and for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see that I am wearing my Flash t-shirt because we're going to be talking about the Flash today. We're going to do a quick review of the movie, and then we're going to talk about the Flashpoint um, theory and how it intersects today with the rewriting of history that is being attempted in our U.S. government. So really quickly about the movie. Obviously, it didn't do as well at the box office as I think DC had hoped it was going to do. Um, certainly, uh, they had high hopes for the production of this film, the script of this film, um, you know, the the place where this film was coming out in terms of the transition from the Snyderverse over to the uh, new MCU or DCU, I'm sorry. And so uh, after a string of box office kind of failures with one woman 84 and shazam fury of the gods and black adam just kind of misses uh from the dceu um there was hopes that the flash was going to be that well that flashpoint that reset um that they were able to jump off and um just on the aesthetics of the movie i would say you know it was pretty good you know there was some shoddy little quirks with the with the cgi there but you know overall i think uh for for what the flash is i think it was a decent i think it was decent i think the 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 visuals were decent i mean uh the cast itself uh they had some really big time cameos in there i mean from you know three different batman with keaton and F, affleck and at the end for those of you who haven't seen it i mean um Clooney shows up as 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 Batman and so they had Gal Gadot in there as uh Wonder Woman and Momoa um Michael Shannon as Zod I mean they had some really you know really big cameos in there and so Sasha Cali uh was there as Kara Zor-El so I think overall I think the film itself had potential I just think it got derailed by forces outside of its own power and so you know as we we look at what happened to the film and look at how it performed worse than uh green lantern which was a surprise uh it performed worse than than, than green lantern and i think a lot of that had to do with the controversy surrounding ezra miller and so but um my review of the film has a lot to do with Ezra Miller's performance now whatever you think about him personally whatever you think about Ezra Miller personally if you take a step back if you just take a step back and really 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 take a look at that performance that was a S tier God level acting performance there, there, there's no really other way to say it. There's no other way to say it for him to establish playing a dual role of the same character with completely and utterly different personalities, completely and utterly different personalities and to have character development in both of those in opposite directions to have character development of both of the variations of the Flash in opposite directions was astounding. I, I found myself literally sitting in the, in the theater marveling at this guy's ability to portray this character. Now, I, I try to suspend judgment. I just go to the film, watch the film, and just review but there is no way that you can sit there and say that that was not 
a top-notch performance of not only Barry Allen, the character, but the younger version of Barry Allen and The Flash. I'm sorry. This was a fantastic acting portrayal by Ezra Miller. And I hope everyone who gets a chance to see the film suspends everything that you know about him. I know that's hard <clears throat> in this day, but you got to take a look at this, this performance. It was, to me, one of the most incredible acting performances that I've seen, not just in a superhero film, but in the last 10 years in movies. I, I thought it was astounding. And I've seen people play two dual characters, but I've never seen I've never seen the entire film be centered around the interaction between the same character and the dual character with that much of the dialogue being against back and forth between the two with completely different personalities. I'm I'm sorry, but this was a fantastic performance. So um, I just wanted to give that quick review of The Flash and then connect it to our political theme of the day, which is the rewriting of history. In the film, Barry runs back in time because he wants to save his mom because he feels like it's a tragedy and it, and it messed up his life. It messed up his dad's life. His dad was in prison uh, about to be sentenced you know, to death because of, you know, his, his supposed murder of his mom. And he, they couldn't figure out why um, his mom was uh, killed and his dad took the fall for it. So he's decided, look, I have all this power and this ability. I can run back in time and fix it all. And even when he was talking to Bruce, uh, Ben Affleck's Batman, he said, hey, look, I can I can save my parents. I can save your parents. I can go back. I can do all of this. You can make it like it never happened. And obviously, Bruce being the, the genius that he is, said, hey, look. Hey, you have to understand. And even Barry was cognizant of the fact that, yeah, you know, there's going to be some potential pitfalls. I can't you know, interact with myself. I can't do all this. And immediately he comes across himself. And so the the entire endeavor is shot the shit like right out the gate. But he tries to make the best of it. But then he starts to realize the incursion that he created had already messed up the timeline. And not to get all quantum, you know, E equals MC square, here in this episode, but you think about time in the sense of like a rock hitting your windshield, right? You're going down the road 70 miles per hour and a rock hits your windshield and it glances off. And so depending on the size of the rock, at this peak, at this point, it could be a small divot or a small little crack in your windshield with little splinters, right? Like a little stars, a little starfish, a little snowflake. Or you could hit it and it could just make a big singular crack and just kind of run along the expanse of your windshield. So yeah, that could that could be what Barry was intended. Okay, we're gonna make this incursion point with this little indention, and then this timeline is gonna go. But the potential for so many different timelines or what's centered around that point of impact. And we saw that later in the film as he's going back and he's keeping, he's keep trying to undo this canon event that is going to happen regardless of what you do. And this is why I want to talk about what happened in the Supreme Court and how across the country, conservatives are trying to rewrite history, specifically black history, in terms of education and affirmative action. And so they're attacking education and they're doing it by trying to rewrite history. First, in Florida, before we get to affirmative action, in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis and the Florida legislature just passed a bill that highlighted how to teach black history. Now, no other, no other history 
has these caveats or these these um designs around misinformation or miseducation of groups aapi uh hispanic or native none of these groups have the type of stringent uh divergent curricula that black history has and so in the latest just frontal assault on black history florida has decided that you can teach slavery but you must teach that slavery had some inherent benefits for african americans or enslaved people slavery had inherent benefits for slaves. That is what Florida is teaching now. It it, it boggles my mind, and it, and it and it makes and it makes this episode all the more poignant, simply because if you look at what they're doing, they're trying to rewrite how we view the atrocities of slavery. So the generations coming behind us will have this watered down view of how bad slavery was and the ripple effects that carried forward hundreds of years later. This essentially cements the ability of certain of groups to continue to discriminate against African-Americans generations to come simply because Kids won't know how bad the history of this country country is. And so it is not just started at the K-12 level. It is now also moved into the collegiate level because the Supreme Court rolled back affirmative action. Now, this is just the next um, wave of assaults on the civil rights era. So 1963 to 1968, LBJ passed a series of uh, civil rights acts around discrimination and housing and voting and and so many things that have uh, closed, that had attempted to close the gap in achievement and wealth for Black Americans versus white Americans. And they have never not stopped being attacked and undermined. So 2008, uh, Barack Obama wins. Two years later, the Supreme Court gets rid of the VRA, uh, Section 4 and Section 5. And since then, voter suppression all through the South has been ha has been rampant, whether it been, it's been voter ID, the closing of um, polling places, the um, inability of uh, DMVs to be able to issue the correct drive, the, the correct IDs, getting rid of Sunday voting, getting rid of same day registration, getting rid of um, regist uh, registering 16 year olds, getting rid of all the things that would inspire a generation to be able to take part in voting. All those things have been attacked, gerrymandering, wiping out black centers of. Uh, voting power, diluting, diluting them, splitting districts to di further dilute power. Hell, in Alabama, there's uh, a, a town that's 85% black, yet the entire town council and mayor is white, and now we have a black mayor, and they refuse to seat him. In a town in Alabama, they just refuse to seat him in a lady and the, the 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 new mayor said that the town in 2023, uh, a lady told the, the the new mayor, the new black mayor that was elected, that the town wasn't ready for a black mayor. It's 2023. But here we are now, fast forward to the Supreme Court, who has just rolled back in the Dobbs decision, just rolled back. Uh, abortion access and rights, uh, Roe, Roe v. Wade. They've uh, now taken on affirmative action. So 
a hundred years of precedent is gone in just one session of the Supreme Court. The John Roberts Court will live in infamy forever. But the rewriting of history is now front and center because we're talking about getting rid of vast sections of the Voting Rights Act because they are deemed discriminatory to white people. Now, I really want you to, to, to hear that. They are discriminatory to white people. Now, let's take a look at the statistics. Black people make up 3% of Harvard. And Harvard and the University of North Carolina, um, my home state, was named in this suit because they explicitly said, we are going to consider race in our decision makings. Why? Because we want the most diverse council, we want the most diverse campus with the most diversity of thought, with the most diversity of backgrounds that we possibly can. We understand that that makes learning institutions better. We get that. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna consider that. So they were explicitly named in the lawsuit. So when this decision comes down, it says Harvard, North Carolina, every no school can take into account race and admit on the basis of race. Now, the irony of all this is that Clarence Thomas, second African-American to ever sit on, sit on the, uh, the Supreme Court, benefited from affirmative action. He's literally where he is today because of affirmative action. And now he's trying to rewrite history so that he can say that he made it on his merits. And I'm not saying he's, he's not. I didn't say, I'm not saying that Clarence Thomas didn't earn his way there. What I know for a fact is in terms of being a, um, being a constitutional scholar, Clarence Thomas was never thought of as that level of judicial thought. So whatever you want to say, maybe he's projecting a little bit. But right now, they're saying that African-Americans have disproportionately benefited at the expense of Asian-Americans and white Americans. Now, Asian-Americans, Asians, make up 25% of Harvard's student body. Asians are 6% of the population, maybe less. So Asians are represented four times their population. African-Americans make up 12%, which is right in line with the population, 13% of the population of the United States. Now, where the issue comes in is that legacy students make up 33%, a third. And of that third, 70% 70 are white, 40% of that, they would not qualify. Now, here's the thing about affirmative action. Affirmative action didn't take a D student out of the inner city of Detroit and put them in Harvard. No, every single student, minority student, who would have otherwise been considered affirmative action qualified on the merits of their academic performance. Every one of them, every one of them. A lot was made by people like Joy Reid and Michelle Obama um, saying, Sheila Jackson Lee saying, yeah, we went to, I went to Harvard uh, because of affirmative action. And what they really said was, hey, I was in a place where Harvard would never come to recruit. Affirmative action only forced Harvard to come to find me. They didn't lower the standards. They didn't change any of the admission process. They just had to come and find me now because there was an, uh, a direct uh, edict from the federal government that said they had to expand uh, admissions for minorities to balance the playing field of his, against historical inequities that this country never fixed. 
And now, here we are, just barely over 50 years. And everybody's saying, oh, everything's good. As a matter of fact, we've gone too far and we're hurting white people. Now, this is going to be tough, white people. It's about, you about to get some tough words. So, you know, if you're still here after this, know I'm saying it in love. The reason why you're so against affirmative action and white women have benefited from affirmative action more than any other group, any other group. White women have been the beneficiaries. White women were included as a protected class in the affirmative action, original affirmative action case. And white women have since re reaped the benefits in education, in uh, in entrepreneurism, and uh, corporate America, finance, government, wherever it is, 77% of the jobs that are considered affirmative action went to white women. So even the laws put in place to help minorities were co-opted and colonized and black women minorities lost out. So now, just like Barry runs back in time and damages the timeline and has unintended consequences, this will also have unintended consequences. And the reason why I say that Progress is a canon event. It's because it always happens. Now, if you're watching the movie, over and over, Barry tries to stop Sasha Callie's Supergirl, Kara Zor-El, from dying. He runs back it. He runs back in time. He runs back, back, back. But every single time she dies, every single time he runs back, she dies. Every time he changes something, she dies. And it doesn't matter. It's a canon event. It is supposed to happen. It is going to happen. No matter what you do, it's going to happen. And by God, progress in this country is a canon event. Slavery ended. Reconstruction. Jim Crow. Segregation. All these things happened in every single point. Progress came through. Now, is it 100%? No. But the country is moving forward. African Americans are moving forward. We're making progress. And I think that is the fear is because here comes the here comes the tough love white people. Your privilege and your inherent racial advantage has made you soft. It has made you mediocre. And I always say, this is the same. You keep talking about the meritocracy that you say you want, but you really don't. And the reason I say that is, is because you can't hide mediocrity in a meritocracy. You can't do it. So as Black people become more educated, as opportunities open up for Hispanics and immigrants, you find yourself struggling to compete on the field that you designed. And so what do you have to do? You have to take out the structural components of your competition. You have to take out the ability to gain a, an education equivalent to yours. You have to take out the ability to, uh, to acquire capital equivalent to yours. You have to segregate through policy rather than fear and violence. And it's getting harder and harder and harder for you to maintain those controls, especially in a world that is now seeing the value of embracing the diversity that is changing this country. Now, the problem, the unintended consequences of these actions could be that white America suffers. And I say that because at some point it's going to occur to people of color that we are not wanted in your spaces. And there may be a natural resegregation. What you may see is you may see black kids 
instead of their dream it, to get into Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Brown in Columbia are going to turn around and say, you know what? I'm going to go to North Carolina A&T and I'm going to bring up North Carolina a and I'm going to go to Coppin State. I'm going to go to Howard. I'm going to go to Morehouse. I'm going to go to an HBCU and I'm going to bring that up. And you're going to see black academics doing that. And ultimately, ultimately, what may be the linchpin is when the black athlete follows. Because here's some more tough love. You may not want us in your classroom, but you damn sure want us on your field. You damn sure want us on your, on your basketball courts and your baseball diamonds. You damn sure want us there. So you can try to erase history all you want and keep us out of your classroom, but the history you're trying to keep is you used to segregate us and not put us in your locker rooms. But you don't want that to go away. And so the unintended consequences are going to be, eventually, we are going to figure out a way to overcome this. And what one way that's always happened is, guess what? These same groups that have fought to protect affirmative action have now said, you know what? The worst affirmative action is legacy admissions. You're unqualified. You're only at Harvard because your dad's name is on the building. Your granddad's name is on the building. Your family's and your family gives a hundred million dollars every year to an endowment. That's why you're there. You're a mediocre student, but you're at Harvard. Right, at Harvard, you're at Yale. You're at Brown in Columbia. You're at Vassar. You're at all these Ivy League schools, and you don't qualify. And so now they're attacking legacy admissions. And so now what you're going to have is you're going to have a bunch of rich scions who just knew they were going to wake up one day with their last name being whatever it is and walk into an Ivy League school. And now that opportunity is gone. That entitlement is gone simply because you couldn't accept the 3% of black kids who went to who went to Ivy League universities via affirmative action. I believe we call this hoisted on your own petard. Oh, and look at the, here I am facing the consequences of my actions. And so what happens is every time Barry went back, he tried to rewrite history. He tried to change it, but it just kept coming. And just like, just like, African-Americans, we're going to keep coming. We are not going to stop. Affirmative action is just another bump in a long winding road to ultimately what black Americans are going to achieve. Polling after polling says that no matter what happens in this country, the most optimistic people in this country are black people. Because we know what we've overcome. We know the adversity we faced. And we keep persevering because we know we're going to be victorious. So Barry ultimately came to the realization, as I believe white America will, I believe that for whatever Clarence Thomas's machinations are, he may not in his lifetime, but the generations that follow him will, is that this country is better when it's diverse. Economic studies have shown, and I'm I'm doing this because that's something that I'm working on right here in High Point, North Carolina, as I'm working on restorative economic policies as a member of city council. I wrote a policy brief on this, is that over the last half century, $51 trillion in GDP has been lost. Brookings, International Monetary Fund, uh, CNBC, Harvard um, School of Finance, you can find this anywhere. And I'll put some of those links in the show notes. But every single one of those studies has shown that this country has lost 
50 trillion dollars 16 trillion since the year 2000 because of structural racism because of institutional racism this country is poorer and weaker if we were less racist there is not a single country on earth that would be within a millennia's chance of catching us as an economic power. We're a $30 trillion economy. We should be an $80 trillion economy. But because of structural racism, because of the denial of capital and entrepreneurism, because of higher interest rates and higher foreclosure rates on African Americans, because of our xenophobic uh, inability to embrace the uh, immigrant population who comes in and doing this. Florida is falling apart right now. It's falling a fucking part because DeSantis and his policies have chased off that segment of the labor population and houses are falling apart. They can't get finished being built. Crops are riding in the field. You've got freaking hotels who can't staff because they don't have the people. All because mediocrity has won the day in the white community. All because you're trying to have, you're trying to hide your mediocrity in a meritocracy and it will stick out. And so what's going on is now you're suffering and I'm trying really hard not to have schadenfreude because I don't want the pain that's inflicted on my country, but it's hard not to sit back and realize what's happening because of the choices that you made, because you've tried to rewrite history, because you've tried to change the past, the future is in doubt. So yes, we are at a flashpoint. We are at a flashpoint. We are at a reckoning. We're at a nexus, and we're facing a canon event because guess what? Progress has never it's been stopped. It's been slowed, but it's never been stopped. It's been delayed, but it's never been denied. And progress will continue in this country. So uh, as we wrap up, I just want you guys to think about what it means to have a diverse country, what it means to have diverse opinions and diverse uh, circles of friends extended family, what that means and how much better you're much, much more rich your life has been because of something, because you've learned from some folks and some people that you don't know. Think about the richness that diversity has brought into your life. Think about every time that you travel to a new country, you come back with a different perspective. You come back with an expanded worldview. But if you, but if you segregate yourself, and you wall yourself off from all the things that are different from you, when you are faced inevitably with those changes, you can't cope. And that's what I'm afraid is going to happen uh, years from now. And this country will be torn apart because of it. I believe that we're going to overcome it. I'm continually optimistic. But we've got work to do, folks. And I am uh, really grateful to be in the fight um, as an elected official. And so um, one thing, thank you guys for being with us uh, today. There's a lot of information that's going to be in the show notes coming up here. But big news, guys, big news. Uh, next weekend, I and Superhero Politics Podcast will be would be moderating uh, my first fan panel at Galaxy Con in Raleigh, North Carolina. And so um, I've already, I've been checking it daily and folks are, are lining up and they're liking the event and they're want to, they're going to come and we're going to film live from there. And we're going to take questions and uh, I'm going to get a lot of great footage there, but it's a really huge event. You know, speaking of the flash, uh, one of the guests who will be there will be Grant Gustin, uh, Stephen Amell from uh, Arrow, um, Karen Gillian from who plays Nebula in the the 
uh, Guardian series. Uh, a lot of Star Wars fans, a lot of Star Star Wars uh, folks there. Billy D. Williams, uh, a lot of lot of great folks. Vampire Diaries folks, uh, Ian Summerholder, Paul Wesley, a lot of cool folks are going to be there. I'm going to try to get some interviews. Going to try to uh, you know not ambush folks, but maybe just step in and uh, introduce myself, and maybe down the road have some of these great guests on Superhero Politics Podcast. So I'll be there next uh, Saturday, the 29th, and uh, we'll broadcast live from there. And We'll also record our next episode. And uh, it is political season, guys. You can't have superhero, um, can't have superheroes and not have politics because it's Superhero Politics Podcast. I am um, running for re-election, guys. I officially launched my campaign on July 7th, and things are going well. And um, if you want to follow my campaign, if you want to uh, get to know what we're doing, the issues that matter, uh, my platform, you can go to homesforhighpoint.com, H-O-L-M-E-S-F-O-R-H-I-G-H-P-O-I-N-T.com. And that'll be in the show notes as well. So please go check out my campaign. Um, if you want to contribute, cool. If you don't, just... Uh, send a well wish and just say, Hey, um, I appreciate the support and the encouragement. This is a tough job, but I love it. And we we'll continue to do the best that we possibly can to move high point and the state of North Carolina and ultimately the country forward. So, um, love you guys. Thank you. Uh, enrich your lives, get to know someone is different from you guys. Be kind to one another, uh, show compassion. And remember we're coming up on political season and voting season. If you ever feel powerless, always know that you do have a power. If you are eligible to vote, make sure that you exercise that because voting is a superpower um, and you can change the world with it. And I know that for a fact. So just remember, until next time, this is your host, Michael Holmes. This is Superhero Politics. And remember, you don't have to be superhuman to be a superhuman. Until next time. Love you guys. We're out.